100 million people, the majority of which are young, the majority of which need to be, you know, fed and provided for, um, that we are very, very focused on how we deliver food security, but not only food security, how we convert a valuable natural resource in agriculture um, into a source of tremendous revenue, into a source of ensuring inclusive growth across you know, both our rural as well as city economies. But more importantly, I think we also have an incredible opportunity to convert agriculture into a source of tremendous you know, foreign currency revenues for our economy. It's therefore um, you know, important that a conversation like this happens. Um, I'm really delighted on behalf of the private sector advisory group on the SDGs to have an opportunity to say a few words. And I hope that we all have a really productive day and I look forward to listening to some of the presentations. Thank you and good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Balogun. Again, that's Dr. Balaji Balogun, the chair of the Private Sector Advisory Group. Now I'm going to invite Ms. Abimbola Okoya, who is the um, chair of Cluster 5 and also the executive director of British America Tobacco Nigeria Foundation. Ms. Abimbola Okoya. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to to give the opening remarks for today. It's been over a year in the making and we're totally delighted to have finally have the, the Masterclass series. So first of all, I would like to start by um, appreciating and recognizing our special guests. Um, we have the Senior Special Advisor to the President on SDGs for, to the Presidency, the Director, Agri Business and Market Development, Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, we also have our keynote speaker, the Acting Country Director, International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, in Nigeria, our distinguished panelists, members of the Private Sector Advisory Group, participants, members of the press. Thank you and good morning. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you officially to the maiden edition of the Business of Agriculture Masterclass series, hosted by the UN, private sector advisory group in Nigeria. The program is supported by the Office of the Senior Special Advisor to the, to the President on SCGs with the objective of tapping into profitable opportunities in, the, in agriculture to build wealth and achieve financial freedom in all its forms in order to drive towards the attainment of the sustainable, sustainable development goals in Nigeria. The Private Sector Advisory Group was formed in April 2015, where a body of concerned organizations within the private sector, academia, NGOs, CBOs, converged together to work in conjunction with the public sector through the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on SDGs and the Vice President, as it was clear that to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals in Nigeria, this could only be done through a concerted effort and partnership of multiple stakeholders. To ensure effective, effectiveness and reach, the group was divided into clusters based on the different thematic goals of the Sustainable Deve Development Goals. One of such clusters was the Agri-Business and Manufacturing Cluster, who have worked in partnership with other key stakeholders to deliver the Business of Agriculture Masterclass Series, which will be kicking off today. The rationale behind the Masterclasses was to achieve awareness and develop capabilities on the Business of Agriculture. The series aims to awaken a social consciousness on the opportunities that abound in the agricultural sector, to evoke a renewed industry, interest in the industry, while accelerating the access to a myriad of resources that exist to establish and strengthen young and established agripreneurs in the sector. The Business of Agriculture Masterclass Series will kick off with an Insta Live session dedicated to inspiring participants from the work of you know, other successful agripreneurs in the, in the industry. This will be followed by nine technical sessions 
one session dedicated to providing background and building a case for investing in agriculture, and eight sessions dedicated to uncovering opportunities across several subsectors in agri-industry. We recognize that the true test of the impact of these masterclass series is the testimonials and success stories that emerge from the landmark event where the organized private sector and public sector, academia, NGOs, CBOs, ETC converged with one singular audacious goal of driving towards the achievement of the SDGs together as one. Esteemed ladies and gentlemen, we hope this collaboration will set the standard beyond Nigeria of how to achieve sustainable development through collective partnership for development to ensure no one is left behind. I would like to end by thanking our partners, collaborators, participants, and observers. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bimbola Okoya. All right, so in, in your speech, you talked about how the private sector advisory group is anchored in the office of senior special advisor to the president on the SDGs. Right now, it's a pleasure to invite Our Excellency um, Princess Ade Joke Orolopo Ade Fuliri, who is represented by her senior technical assistant, Dr. Bala Uniser, to give his goodwill message. Um, okay, very good um, morning, distinguished participants. Let me, on behalf of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on SDGs, Her Excellency Princess Adejoke or Lokbe Adeflure, uh, bring warm greetings to you. She would have loved to be here, but unfortunately um, had to attend to other issues and has kindly asked me uh, to represent her here and to also deliver her, her remarks. Uh, so I now read her remarks. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be here with you and to deliver this address at this business of Agriculture Nigeria Masterclass, the first of its kind. Let me from the outset congratulate the leadership of the Private Sector Advisory Group uh, on SDGs in Nigeria for leading this effort and encouraging the private sector participation in the business of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in Nigeria. Indeed, there is no other fertile ground for me to preach the gospel of sustainable development to the organized private sector and our youth than this strategic platform. Our distinguished speakers and participants, uh, I want to specifically thank the leadership of PISA once again for inviting me, and I'm delighted to deliver this address specifically on the role of agriculture in enabling the SDGs. This, is a, this will certainly provide insights on how to strengthen system-wide solutions that reach beyond individual organizations to exploit the potential business opportunities in agriculture and to inspire Nigerians to engage in agribusiness either directly or indirectly. Uh, distinguished participants recall that it is a little above five years since President Muhammad Buhari joined other world leaders during the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly uh, in September 2015 to adopt the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 2030 Agenda envisions a present and a future that is economically sustainable, socially inclusive, and environmentally resilient. Uh, this vision is expressed through the framing of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, 169 targets, and 230 key performance indicators. Uh, broadly, uh, distinguished participants, the SDGs are a universal call to action to end extreme poverty, safeguard the planet, and ensure all people enjoy peace and prosperity by the year 2030. Uh, the SDGs are interrelated, interconnected, and designed to take a holistic approach to addressing the social, economic, and environmental aspect of sustainable development. Although agriculture, which obviously is the main focus of SDG 2, which aims to achieve zero hunger and malnutrition and double agricultural productivity and income of smallholder farmers is also embedded in SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production, SDG 13 on climate action, and SDG 14 and 15 related to conserving, uh, conserving aquatic 
and terrestrial life. Similarly, agriculture is also the focus of SDG 5, specifically on promoting women's right to land ownership. Indeed, eight other SDGs relating to ending poverty, gender discrimination, inequality, and environmental degradation, and promoting healthy lives and well beings are all central components to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Thus, the saying, agriculture is the common thread that holds the 17 SDGs together. Uh, distinguished participants, a holistic approach is required through the organized private sector to support ministries, departments, and agencies uh, by leveraging on PSAC's transformative leadership to move away from the business as usual for a joint outcome. This will be a great opportunity to accelerate SDGs implementation in Nigeria and to help the country build back better from the impact of COVID-19. As, as you may all well be aware, Nigeria is potentially an agricultural powerhouse, and agriculture has been the mainstay and the driver of the nation's economy before the discovery of oil in commercial quantities in the early 70s. The country has 75.9% of arable land and could grow enough food to meet its own needs and export surpluses. Yet hundreds of millions of Nigerians go home hungry. Despite recent progress, farmers in Nigeria are mostly uh, uh, smallholders who battle to grow, uh, obviously uh, due to uh, lack of um, financing, um, best agronomic practices, and access to market. The recent report released by the National Bureau of Statistics for quarter 1, 2021, showed that agriculture accounts for 22.35% of the country's gross domestic product uh, at a growth rate of 2.28% and is expected to rise to 3.75% by 2025 based on the 2021 to 2025 medium-term national development plan. It is gladdening to state that OSAP SDGs uh, under my leadership has partnered with key government uh, ministries, departments, and agencies, including development partners, and have initiated several policies and programs to mainstream and accelerate SDGs implementation that is largely inspired by the cardinal objectives of this administration and is centered around agriculture as an enabler for accelerating the SDGs. Uh, some of this includes the CBN and Cobra program to support smallholder farmers, the agro-processing, agricultural productivity enhancement and livelihood support appeals program to enhance the productivity of small and medium scale hold, uh, smallholder farmers, support of Nigeria's economic diversification agenda and promoting of decent employment for youths and women in agricultural value chains in Nigeria. A distinguished participants, it is pertinent to note that unlocking the potentials of the private sector is fundamental to the progress of the SDGs in Nigeria. Engaging with entrepreneurs and tapping into the expertise and resources of the organized private sector, including agricultural producer organizations, cooperatives, small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as international corporations, is a prerequisite for the achievement of the SDGs. Private sector also play a critical role in leveraging on their capacity to facilitate access to productive resources, connect smallholder um, farmers to market, build producer knowledge and develop their capacities, strengthen innovation system along the value chain, especially in the agricultural cycles and have the capacity to support improvement of investment and financing. Thus there is need for greater investment in areas where the need and potential for increasing agricultural productivity and production are greatest. This will help feed growing population sustainably while creating jobs and incomes across rural areas, particularly for young people and women. Indeed, history shows that increasing agricultural productivity is, is a critical driver of socioeconomic transformations of societies. Relatedly, we must ensure that agriculture and food systems become nutrition smart because it is not just about the amount of food we grow, it is also about the type of food uh, that we consume. For we are what we eat, says Kofi Annan of blessed memory. As private sector, we must push for climate smart agriculture and food systems. Cutting down agricultural climate footprint 
and shifting towards renewable energy sources will not only help to avoid climate catastrophe, but also create new opportunities for investment, growth, and employment, while strengthening farmers' resilience to climate-related shocks. Distinguished participants, in line with the transformative promise of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, I want to conclude by reaffirming Nigeria's commitment to the successful implementation of the SDGs. I look forward to working closely with you all in this decade of action for the global goals so that no Nigerian is left behind. Once again, congratulations, and I wish you all fruitful masterclass. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Your Excellency. Yes, you're right. Nigeria is an agricultural powerhouse, um, and it's very important that we drive the sector in order to get sustainable job creation, employment, and economic growth. Thank you very much. Now we're, we're heading close to the end of our opening ceremony, but before that, we're going to have our keynote address by Dr. Patrick Habermanger, the country director of International Fund for Agricultural Development. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants. Allow me to stand on existing protocols. Let me start by giving you Mr. Edward Callon's regards. Our UN resident coordinator could not be with us here today as he's on duty travel and he asked me to represent him. It is therefore my pleasure and my honor to stand in for him and, and do this keynote address on his behalf. I have the privilege to work for an organization, the International Fund for Agriculture Development, IFAD, one of the UN-based ROM, uh, UN ROM based agencies that was created to ensure that the most vulnerable uh, populations are lifted out of poverty as the world is moving forward and uh, a progress reaches every corner of the world. In the last 44 years since our organization was created, the world demographic has changed so drastically and so did our strategies to tackle the problems of the day. A key change in the world demographic is that our population is extremely young, probably the youngest it has ever been in modern times. Did you know that over 1.8 billion young people in the world, we have 1.8 billion young people in the world, about 90% of that population lives in developing countries. Did you know that? And did you know that almost 60% of Africa's population is under the age of 25, making Africa the youngest continent in the world? Did you know that about 62% of Nigeria's population is under 25 years old, which makes Nigeria the youngest country on the continent? <clears throat> we must therefore prepare the way for you, the young people, as the future belongs to you, or should I say the present, because we are already there. What opportunities that the sector offer to you Normally, I would start by telling you about the agriculture sector and tell you what the sector can bring to you. But I will do the opposite. I will recognize you, the young people, and tell you what makes you the perfect fit for the agriculture sector. We rarely take the time to think about it, but youth are responsible for some of the greatest inventions in the world and some of the greatest shifts in our society time and time again. How? Youth have the capacity to dream big. Youth have a unique capacity to adapt to changing times. Youth have a capacity to learn and youth have a capacity to innovate. So agriculture is your home. Agriculture is a place to dream big. If there was ever a sector where the word big has all its meaning, it's the agriculture sector, especially in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria employs, is big in terms of employment, Nigeria agriculture. 70% of the country labor force is employed by agriculture. I, agriculture is big in terms of available land, 91 million hectares of land, of which 81 million is arable land. And we have 18 million hectares of land that are classified as permanent pasture for livestock production. 
Nigeria agriculture is big in terms of the potential to produce practically anything we want. The whole country has rich soils and enjoy regular rains and has a diversity of ecosystems from the south to the north, from the east to the west, that can allow us to do just that. Nigeria agriculture is, is big in terms of number of farmers. Contrary to what you may think, Nigerian agriculture is not carried by big industrialized farmers, and it has been said uh, by a, a previous speaker, agriculture, Nigerian agriculture is carried by smallholder farmers. 80% of total food in Nigeria, total food production is by smallholder farmers. Agriculture is a place to adapt to a changing era. Agriculture has known an extraordinary shift from your parents' generation to today. Agriculture has gradually modernized with an increasing use of inputs and mechanization. The market demands have also increased in the last 50 years. While Nigeria was practically self-sufficient in the early 70s, the country heavily relies today on imports to meet its food and agriculture products needs. We import wheat, rice, poultry, fish, food services, and consumer-oriented consumer uh, products worth about $10 billion US dollars annually from Europe, Asia, the United States, South America, and South Africa. Most of these products can be grown in the country given the right condition. There is also a vast potential for export, which today are dominated by practically two produce, sesame and cocoa. So with your openness to the world, you can better understand the opportunities offered by our trade relations with our other countries. Having said that, we also recognize that agriculture is no longer just about production and encouraging the creation of farms, but it's also about engaging actors along organized value chains from production to processing, transport, inputs, and other service provision and marketing. All those are agriculture. With the entrepreneur, while the entrepreneur used to be just your urban trader, investor, or head of industry, today we are talking about agripreneurs and is part of our lexicon. Agriculture today wouldn't be anything if we did not encourage the creation of enterprises and the creation of employment. That is very important. Agriculture is a place where learning is valued. Some of the most successful agri entrepreneurs or agripreneurs we work with today had no experience in agriculture before or little experience, yet today they are successful in the sector. There are some examples. Uh, I recently visited some of the farmers we work with in Abe Okuta in Ogun State, and some of them went from five hectares producing uh, cassava on five hectares of land. Now they are organized producing on 300 hectares of land. They are cooperatives, associations, they go and they, they buy their own tractors with the money they are making with cassava. It's the same with the rice sector. We also have programs where we are working with uh, youth in the Niger Delta incubators program where we place them with uh, entrepreneurs, they learn the trade and then tomorrow they will go and set up their own businesses. And you find so much enthusiasm and a lot of those young people who are in those programs were not employed in agriculture before. Some of them didn't even have any employment. So this is the right place that they are finding a place to build their future. Agriculture is a place that is yearning innovation. We have similar incubation programs in other countries and you find that there's a, a yearning to bring innovations to the sector. Young people want to go in niche products. They want to go in organic products. They want to go in uh, biologic production. They want to bring digital platforms to do trade, to, to provide information on markets. So those are things that are happening today and all of that is agriculture. So yes, agriculture is becoming digital thanks to the young people. So we, we cannot only talk about creating employment, we also are creating enterprises. We also like you to think of yourself as somebody who can be an, an employee if it is possible. If you are not building an enterprises, there will be room for employment, but you need to have the right skills. So you need to find a way to learn, learn, always find any opportunity to learn so you can have the skills that it takes in the agriculture of the future.
I would say one last word about wealth because that is also important. Agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to the country's GDP. About 24% of our GDP in Nigeria is from agriculture. We have also in the 20 richest companies in Nigeria, four of those companies are doing agro-processing, four out of 20. When you think that the 20s are dominated by old oil companies, dominated by the service industry dominated by the financial industry, it is big to see that agriculture ha can have its place there. Does it mean that everything I say today, that the path is easy in agriculture? No, it isn't. The path is difficult like in any other sector. And this masterclass will give you the opportunity to discuss about those difficulties, to discuss about those challenges, to discuss about the different value chains and where you can find your own place. And most importantly, you will also discuss about who can support you to reach that dream. Organization like UN organizations, the federal government of Nigeria, and other structures that are there to support young people to succeed in everything that they want to do. So today, take this opportunity to learn ask the right questions, you will get the answers. And sometimes you won't get all the answers today, but you will learn that a life is about learning. So there will be challenges, but always remember that the biggest, the challenges, the biggest, the reward. So thank you for inviting me today to this uh, uh, session. It is a pleasure to be here. And I congratulate the organizers for convening this masterclass. It's a, it's a milestone in itself. So thank you for having me here and I wish you a pleasant deliberations. Thank you very much, Dr. Abramantia. Thank you very, very much. Yes, you're right. Agriculture is the key and there's wealth in agriculture and there's wealth in Nigeria. And the youth, youth are central to ensuring that we grow the space and become a powerhouse. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone again to the Business of Agriculture Masterclass. Um, this is a learning series. So again, I encourage you to get your notebook, to get your pen, because you're going to learn a lot. I also like to encourage you to be open-minded, to think outside the box, and to ask whatever questions you have um, from our experts. The experts that we have on the, on, the, on the Masterclass series are consultants and individuals with so much experience that if you were to engage them personally, you would have had to spend millions and millions of Naira. But we brought them to you free because we believe that this is our way of giving back. All right, um, just a reminder that the masterclass is three days, it's going to run for three days from Monday the 5th to Wednesday the 7th of July. Um, we're looking at seven value chains and we have nine sessions. We're going to be spotlighting things like crop production and biofortification. We're going to look at nutrition and lifestyle, agribusiness financing. Um, for the tech guru gurus, we're going to be looking at agri-tech. We're also going to be looking at aquaculture. We're going to be looking at value addition. And most importantly, we're going to be looking at financing agri financing all right so we're going to go on a quick break if you need a glass of water now will be the time to get it um, if you need your pen if you need to call a friend to log on now will be the time to do it so i'll see you shortly after the break All right, so welcome everyone. Now we're going to head into the first panel conversation or discussion of the day, the business of agriculture in Nigeria. Right, so the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics last year released data, right, that there was a 67% decline in the income of individuals during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we realized is that majority of this decline in income came from non-farm businesses. If there's anything that we've learned during the COVID-19 pandemic is that we need multiplicity of income and we also need to diversify our investment portfolio. 
In this session, we're going to be discussing the business of agriculture and we're going to be demystifying the myths and fears that have grown around the sector. And joining me in this conversation are experts in the field. I'd like to invite um, Dr. Debo Akonde. Um, Dr. Debo Akonde is the executive assistant to the governor of Oyo State to the executive assistant to the governor of Oyo State on agribusiness, and he's the director general of the Oyo State Agribusiness Development Agency. He's a senior specialist with the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, with close to 20 years of international development management experience in both sub-Sahara Africa and around the world. You're welcome, Dr. Akonde. I also like to invite to, to, to the panel um, to discuss the business of agriculture, Dr. Ikechuku Kelumo. Kelumi. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so Dr. Ikechuku Kelekume leads sessions in microeconomic and macroeconomic environment of business and agribusiness at the Lagos Business School. He obtained his doctoral degree in economics from Swiss Management Center University. Um, and he's currently the program director of agribusiness at Lagos Business School. Uh, my last guest needs no introduction. He just concluded the keynote address, and you can see that he's very knowledgeable in this field. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Patrick Abamenshi um, to join me in this panel discussion. All right, so thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I'm very excited to see everyone here today. Um, so the, I mean, the, the president, right, the president of the country, um, in June this year said when he retires and at the end of his tenure, he's going to go back to his farm. President Olusegun Obasanjo on his LinkedIn page describes himself as the CEO of Obasanjo Farms. Recently, we found out that a multinational, Juliet Berger, who is into construction, has diversified into agriculture, specifically cashew. And even Mikano, an energy company known for the for the creation and distribution of um, generators has gone into agricultural production and is exporting chocolates. Now we also know that there's been a lot of a lot of um, awareness or there's been a lot of clout around crowdfunding for agribusinesses. And what we realized is that a lot of people are beginning to put down their hard-earned money into agricultural enterprises without the collateral. My question to all my panelists today is what is it about the business of agriculture that will make two presidents boldly declare themselves as farmers, that will make two multinationals diversify into agribusiness, that will make individuals young, old, um, um, you know, rich, average income, upwardly mobile, put their investment into agricultural enterprises, expecting high yields without any collateral. Is business of agriculture, is agriculture actually a gold mine? Are there really opportunities in this sector? Is that a trade secret that we need to know? I'll start with my first panelist, Dr. Akonde. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think you've, you've, you've also hit the nail in, on the head. Um, it is a gold mine, and that is the reality. If we are talking about a business um, that, uh, if you look at the import side of business itself, that was over $10 billion. billion. Um, I think it's just uh, make any sense for any individual or, or that's interested in uh, getting engaged in any business to tap into that. Uh, beyond that, um, it is one of the businesses that I think, in my own opinion, that will forever have clients or customers. Um, we will all eat, uh, regardless of where we are, who we are. And, and it means that um, if you do things rightly and you're able to uh, target those customers that are in existence, then you will, you will forever have a business that, that you are doing in the layman time. So in, from, from that angle, I think it's, uh, it, it shows the reason why uh, those that you have mentioned, the two um, um, are the head of state and former head of state, are engaging in that. And beyond that, with the companies that were also mentioned. 
But going beyond that, um, we we the discussion that have, have been done has focused us strongly on, on even what we can do within the country alone, our country as Nigeria. But across board, we don't beyond even the country, uh, going ac ac across the whole of sub Saharan Africa. It is a need. Um, we've just have signed the, I mean, we've just started engaging in the FCA, FCTA um, agreement across the, that's going to be uh, implemented across the whole of Africa. Uh, one of the critical areas of the AFCT would be the issue of uh, food production or food value chain. Um, any any person that uh, uh, that is looking deeply into this, we see great opportunities that we exist or that is already existing actually, but that this uh, uh, agreement will provide more opportunity for such to, to happen. So, looking at it from all those lame and you know perspective, we will realize why it is essential and it's important for anybody that is interested in doing any business. To get engaged in it. Having said this, uh, it is not uh, as easy as uh, one as uh, uh, portrayed it now. Like every, any other businesses, you have uh, so many um, uh, knowledge that needs to be gained. You have so many skills that needs to be built. Um, you have uh, uh, so many uh, soft um, skills that needs to be put in place. And I believe all this will be discussed further as we engage in the discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Akonde. So I'll hand over to Dr. Kelly Kuma. So thank you for having me and good morning, everyone. I, in answering your question, I want to disagree a bit where we say agriculture is, the, is, the, is a gold mine. Agriculture is just one of it. If you look at the chain, the, the agri, if a combination of the agriculture stroke agri business value chain you have the pre-upstream, you have the upstream, you have the midstream, and you have the downstream. Now, agriculture can be situated within the upstream where you have the production in crop, livestock, forestry, and fishery. Interesting when we look at the, the narrative and we look at the description that, oh, 24% of our GDP comes from agriculture. Interesting when you look at productivity from this sector. Again, interesting when you look at the losses that occurs within this value chain. Over 50% of our, uh, our productivity is lost to post-harvest losses, which makes it a very difficult and complex um, sector. If you now add insecurity to that number, over 60% is lost to the, to, the, to the value chain, to post-harvest losses, when you add insecurity. So the interesting part of this narrative is that it is not agriculture that can be classed as a gold mine. It is a combination holistic combination of the pre-upstream, the upstream and the midstream, if we develop all these sectors simultaneously, that actually will breed your so-called gold mine. So permit me to even explain this further. The pre-upstream is a sector where you actually don't find the small time players. The way agriculture is situated is that you have 80% smallholder farmer and 20% medium to large scale farmers. So if you're looking at the big farmers, they play in the 20% range. The small time farmers play in the 80% range. Now these farmers can actually not aggregate an acre or a plot of land. So this is the problem. So when you look at the narrative, the pre-upstream is that sector that has to do with climate change, has to do with weather, has to do with um, irrigation, infrastructure, power, energy, seed, pests and diseases. Now that sector is a sector that is left to the multinational firms, the governments the big time players that are going into agriculture, no small time player can actually address the pre upstream. Now the upstream is where you have the, the direct farming. The midstream is where you have the, the processing, the processors, those who process, those who add a little value. Whilst the downstream is where you, you generally have the multinational firms aggregating and exporting and, and taking products to the market. So if we can combine all of these sectors simultaneously and grow all of this, simultaneously, then we'll probably will be speaking about agriculture as a gold mine. The way it is situated today, I don't see it as a gold mine. I see many players enter and get their fingers burnt. The biggest challenge is not funding. The biggest challenge we see here is the knowledge base. A lot of missing link in terms of understanding the sector, the diversity and the complexity of the agricultural sector. So this is the biggest problem. Our focus should be how do we even uh, begin to make youths see the diversity of opportunities within this sector? How do we begin to encourage the government to go into creation of those things that will make agriculture fly? 
Don't tell me to go into farming if the, the cattle herders will destroy my farm. I probably would will be discouraged to go into that space. So these are the issues. It's a gold mine if we can harmonize all of this value chain together to grow the sector. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Kelly Kumare. I like the way you've expanded the conversations. And, you know, like I said and, and told our participants earlier, you know, nothing is off the table. We're going to be as real as possible and we're going to try to address the issues. So fine, we understand that there are certain challenges across all sectors and agriculture is not immune to it. And it's great, you know, you talked about how we have different players in the field and there are obviously different entry points. Um, what we're hoping to achieve at the end of the masterclass is that everybody on the call, regardless of where they are, if they are big players or small players, if they are novice or if they are experts, they can find an entry point and we can give them skills or, or advice and technical um, um, support they need to sort of upskill or, you know, um, pass through whatever hurdles that is. So thank you. Thank you, doctor. So I'm going to go over to Dr. Patrick to tell us what is it about the business of agriculture that would make people want to look into that sector and take advantage of the opportunities it presents? Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, I, I, I will uh, maybe sound very strange, but I will say that agriculture is in fact a, a gold mine. But uh, let me first say why I, I'm making that comparison to, to a gold mine is that even the the real gold mines you don't just go and uh, and find gold on the you know just by scratching the soil there's a lot of work it takes to get the gold out of the the the, the land so we often think as the gold mine as when the gold is extracted and then we are making lots of money but it's hard work it requires hard work so agriculture like any other sector requires a lot of work it is indeed it is a sector that is uh, exposed to a lot of elements that we don't control. Uh, climate is one of them. Insecurity was mentioned, but again, insecurity affects all the sectors, not just agriculture, but it's one of the, 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 the things that we have to look at. Uh, our soils also are depleting, so that is also a reality. But the, 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 I believe the reason many go to agriculture one, one reason was given by Dr. Akande earlier is that there is a huge market. Just food, food itself represents such a huge market. We eat and we will never stop to eat. And sometimes we eat more than we should be eating, but that's another problem. So there's a market. And when you go on uh, in the market, the supermarkets, you find that where our products are not, they are substituted by other products. So the, the demand is there, but sometimes we don't meet the demand. So somebody might say, let me go and try to meet that demand that is out there. Now, you have to learn to, to address all these challenges when you go in a sector. Uh, one of the things that I would say that is positive about the agriculture sector is that the agriculture practices are something that we've known for generations. Agriculture practices are actually one of the things that change the least. In, 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 you will find that agriculture practices are the same. What changes is that there's some new inputs, maybe some new techniques that we are doing, but those are often easy to, to apply. They are not complicated. If they tell you this seed will give you higher yield, research has done the, the work. The IITA has done the work. You don't need to do any research, but you will need to find what are the seeds that you need. The same with inputs. You don't just go and put any inputs on the soil. You need to understand your soil. So you will know which combination of mineral and organic uh, uh, inputs that you will use. So all of those things are things that we need to learn when we go in that business. And I believe the, the, the people you mentioned, the former head of state, don't just go in without learning all of that. They take that time to learn it. We need to do that. Also in agriculture, one of the challenges that we often have is access to finance. It, it, many financial institutions view the sector as risky. So we have to find a way to, to, to reduce the risk and show them that we can master the, those risks. 
So there's a lot of work that it it um, uh, it we need to do for this sector to work, but it is doable. And those who have done it, I mean, they make they it they, it's a profitable business. I see a lot of uh, not only the big the big names. Uh, we have small farmers who do chicken poultry production. They tell you, I grow five. I, I'm rearing 500 birds. 500 birds. It's not like a million birds. 500 birds, and in a few cycle a year, they can make a living with 500 birds, and they can grow maybe by the end of a year, they can have 1,500, 2,000 birds, and and keep growing. But they need to vaccinate. They need to get the right, uh, the right, uh, the, the heat, the right building. All of that are things that we know. We have veterinarians who are there for that. So let's not be all gloomy about this sector. Yes, there are challenges, but any sector has challenges. But we have to learn what those challenges are and how do we master those challenges. I mentioned uh, climate is one of the issues that we have in the sector. The rains are irregular. Some areas don't even have uh, enough rains, like in the northern part of the country. But then irrigation is there. We can irrigate. We have to learn how to do micro irrigation if we have very small farms. So for every problem, there is a potential solution and you have to bring the solution. If you only look at the problems, you will not go in any sector in the world. But if you look at the sector at each challenge and what solution you can bring, then you can make a, a profit in this sector because there are people making a life in this sector. It's not all failing. There are people who are succeeding. Some are succeeding big. Others are su succeeding at a very small scale. There are some failures. It happens in every sector, but there are some successes and we need to look at those as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. And you're very right. If we look and focus on the challenges, we will never get to do anything or we will not go far. Um, Ms. Dr. Akonde, this next question is from for you. Um, and I'd like you to bring to bear your, your experience, both at the grassroots and also um, upstream. Um, so right now, you're, you're working with the gov government of or your state. So I'm aware that you're very connected to the people. Um, and we're also aware that you have a very influential position um, across international platforms. So while you are relating to the grassroots, you're also relating to policymakers, and you're also relating to investors. Now, we're, we're in the 21st century, um, a generation X or Gen, Gen X, they call it, we call ourselves, right? Um, we're in the tweet like share world. Um, we're in a world where you're meant to make your point in 200 words words or share a video in 59 seconds. We are fast paced. Now, a lot of people also believe that in terms of, of, of amplifying their investment, whatever opportunity they go into, they should be able to get their resources or they should be able to get their return on investment in a very short period. Now, we know that agriculture requires a level of patience. When you plan today, you do not harvest tomorrow. It takes time. But we also know that in agriculture, the more you cultivate, the more you get, or the, the, the more, the more um, chickens or, or poultry you have, like Dr. Patrick has said, then the more resources um, you're, you're likely to earn. Now, with a generation that is fast paced, with a generation that is impatient, right? Um, th there, there is an affinity to go into agriculture because they believe that it requires heavy investment of funds, heavy investment of time, heavy investment of supervision. And the question is, what is the point? Right. I can invest in Bitcoin, for example, and get my ROI almost immediately. Right. Um, I can invest in in some farm crowding activity and get up to 45 percent almost immediately. So why should I even go or bother going into agriculture? Um, so from your ex experience and from your perception, um, if you were to speak to me, for example, a Generation X person, what would be your advice um, based again on your experience so far uh, thank you very much for um, for the points you raised and for mentioning the generation X which you rightly said you you belong to and it, it is um, you you're quite right you know it's factual 
that that this generation are quite interested in getting it like now. Um, and you're right. I work with the government of Oyo State. I advise the governor on on on, on the agribusiness uh, sector for the state. Uh, I also work with IITA um, as the head of the agribusiness for Sub-Saharan Africa. And that uh, role has given me the uh, opportunity, both roles has given me the opportunity to work with a lot of young people. And that's the reason why I made reference to those positions. Um, at IITA, I, I was part of those that helped develop the, <clears throat> the whole prog program on uh, that uh, Dr. Patrick mentioned on Agripinio, uh, which has now uh, skyrocketed and uh, snowballed to many other projects that are called Sub-Saharan Africa. Similar thing is happening with the states that I currently work with. And one of the critical things that I need to mention um, that is quite important, and I believe again it was uh, it was during Dr. Patrick's uh, initial uh, speech that he gave a statistics about the percentage of the young people that are below the age of 25 in terms of uh, our population, which stands 62 percent. You know that is quite high, meaning that whatever uh, uh, we want to design for agriculture these days, we have to put in perspective the. Uh, the kind of a formation of this that particular percentage of, of the population to understand who they are and that should uh, a, 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 a way of, of us um, engaging with them. Now, um, one of the things that was done and that I will say that I believe that needs to be done and that should be done consistently is to ensure that uh, we uh, put programs like this that you are having in place to help support a mindset uh, changing. Um, with the program that we did on the Hagropineo, there was quite a long process of uh, mindset changing. Um, they came into the program as well to just engage and assume that the money is going to be flowing in the next few few months. Um, but uh, you, uh, after a period of time, making them to realize the importance of uh, of, of of what they are engaging in, the um, some of the challenges that exist in it, as uh, Dr. Mikichuku um, uh, pointed out in his own on, on, on own speech. The, the few, or uh, should I say, a good number of them that are interested in engaging were retained. And I must say, a good number didn't continue. So one has to be very honest with them to let them understand the, the challenges that exist. Um, I don't believe that every young people will be engaged in, in agribusiness. I believe that some would look at the challenges and say that, you know what, like every other areas that I, 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 I am, you know, um, I think I can face the challenges. But what is most important is that you one is honest with, with them. You make them to see that it is not all woo, you know, it is um, not an area where you just jump into and then magic start happening like many people portray. It has its own challenges like any other business. And rightly said, the challenges is not as different to any other business. Any people has engaged in any business in the past, you will know that many businesses in this world, regardless of what sector they have, they have a lot of challenges, a, good, a lot of Successful uh, entrepreneurs will tell you that what you are seeing today as their major, uh, the dangotes, the uh, whatever of this world, probably was not their first business. Most times, you know, they've done one or two things that they have failed at. I mean, maybe not the word use failed, um, that they have, that they have, uh, that they have, uh, they, they have burnt their fingers, if you can use that. And they learned, you know, I've, I've been in business, I'm, I'm also in business now. Um, I'm, I've done many things in my life that didn't come as successful as expected. You know, and, and then now I have a business that is working well. If it becomes a household name tomorrow, people will just look at the household name. You know, so we need to let a young generation know that. And this is not peculiar to agriculture. It is a similar thing that applies in every other business. So that is one. The second thing that is that is going well for them or for the generation is that they are uh, in an agriculture in a, in, a, in, a, in a time where they have access easily to information. And um, what do I mean by that? I mean, you rightly said it, they're high tech, they engage in the use of uh, uh, information technology, where they can access quite a lot of, of information now. They should ensure that they don't just go into agribusiness, but they should seek for knowledge. You know, and whether you are having that knowledge informally or formally, it is highly essential for you to get built with knowledge. And the knowledge, the information is vast available, you know, online. Talk less of talking about organizations like IFAD or ITA or many others that are readily uh, available to support all these young ones in their knowledge towards what they want to do in agribusiness. Um, many other things that I will also mention is that the peer, peer relationship, they have a good number of young people of their age 
that has engaged in the business and are now quite successful. I can count on top of my fingers 20 of those ones that are, you know, that are, that are in existence. They could, they could seek a kind of a peer relationship with them and get to know what are the things that they have learned that they, they failed at or they, they bond their fingers at and that is making them to become better now. They are, and what I found interesting about the young people is that they are more than happy to share um, ideas with their peers. They, they, I mean, I, I can tell you about a particular young man, you know, um, that is uh, growing a, a vegetable in a, in a, 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 in a, um, in a your state now, and is actually su supplying a good number of uh, of uh, uh, simply green limited, supplying number numbers of uh, of uh, of a supermarket in, in Nigeria. He requested from us in our youth program within the state that a good number of them to come to him for apprenticeships, and he trained them, you know, um, for them to start developing their enterprises along the line of the business that he's doing you know because as far as he is concerned you know i mean ordinarily people wouldn't have done that they would have said oh you know this is my business i don't want other people to know what i'm doing. but in his own opinion I and mean, with his analysis he mentioned that he can't meet the market but by virtue of even engaging this young one in engaging in the business he has actually created another 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 business for himself because now he's engaging in mentoring in he's engaging and it has become a kind of a business for him as well you know that he's doing so I always say that, you know, when you're talking about agribusiness, and I believe this is what we are talking about here, you know, uh, with many other challenges that exist, great, we should see, I mean, for me, I like to see glass half full rather than a glass half, half empty. Um, you always have all those challenges, but there are also solutions to them as well. Um, one of the critical areas to agribusiness could be the issue of uh, uh, soft and hard infrastructures, you know, that has probably not been, we probably, I believe we'll be talking about it at, at a point in time. So what we are talking about now is the soft side of the infrastructures. We are, um, you provide mindset changing education in that particular area, you strengthen peer relationship, you support uh, uh, mentoring, you know, and, and all what have you. And as this goes on, um, you see that the, the, the percentage of those ones that wants to engage in the hybrid business start increasing, and those that will be retained get retained. But as, as has been said, and as it is with any other business, uh, you will find out that a good number of the young people will say, be based on this reality that I've had, based on this reality that I've seen, I don't think this is good enough. For and that is fine, you know. And when we are talking about agriculture or agribusiness, I think it's good to always continuously mention that we are referring to a broad range of value chains. You are talking about, as has been said, from the uh, 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 from the downstream, the midstream to the upstream. So there are diverse areas where they can get engaged. It's not just about production. It's not just about processing. There are, you have agro logistics. You have uh, advisory services. You have many other areas as well. So make this as wide as, as as necessary to them. Let them see all the potential that existed. Let, let them see all the business that is that is created. And maybe they would rather work, want to engage in the uh, in, in the in the uh, upstream or the midstream rather than the rather than the, rather, than the, rather than the downstream. All this, I believe, will be very useful for the younger generation that wants to come and engage in our business. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Akande, for that down-to-earth um, advice. Um, you know, you talked about doing your risk analysis. So if you're a young person and you want to go into agriculture, you need to do your risk analysis and determine if agriculture is for you. You also need to seek knowledge and you also need to get a mentor. And you also need to know that if you decide to go into the sector, you are going to have all you know encounter lots of highs and lows but it will be worth it thank you once again dr akonde my next question is for dr kelly kumar um, earlier in the conversation, you talked about um, upstream, midstream, downstream, and you also talked about some of the challenges that we face in the agricultural sector. Um, and I know that you said what we need to discuss will be how we can ride or, or, or thrive above these challenges. So my question is that there are key structural challenges like insecurity, there's um, limited power supply, there's logistical bottlenecks, there's trade bureaucracy, um, um, you know, we, ha we have we have um, um, farmers being kidnapped on their farms. We're having a um, hike in food prices. At some point, we had regional crises, you know, where um, food items were not being transported from the north because uh, because of um, some civil unrest. So, so what are the tips you can share to help people overcome some of these challenges that are beginning to feel like every day, you know, like part of our everyday life? I'll, I'll just give you an example of how 
complex this is because the, the, the problem you just talked about is a macro problem. It is, not an, it is not a micro problem. And when you're dealing with a macro problem, it becomes very difficult to solve. So it has to be addressed by the government. It has to be addressed by all stakeholders. It is not for the farmers to address insecurity. We cannot address it. For example, I have a farm. I started a palm plantation three years ago. Last year, I went to the farm and they told me, that community told me, sir, you cannot enter the forest. They, you're either going to be kidnapped or something will happen to you. We don't guarantee that if you enter, you will come out. So that farm, this is the second year, I have not been able to access that farm. So imagine that in all our communities, we have farmlands that these smallholder farmers cannot, especially women, they can no longer access their farms. So this is, this is why today a tuba of yam is going for 3,000. This is why we are now splitting yams in the market to sell. They're now splitting, so we're beginning to see a new trend that you cannot cut yam into pieces to sell to, to consumers. So it is food crisis, it is looming. And the biggest bottleneck is insecurity, kidnapping, banditry within our farmlands. We cannot, con individuals cannot fight this war. It has to be the government. Government must come in as a major stakeholder to begin to address this. So I don't think I have any advice to give to farmers because I am equally one of them. I started a snailry, a snail farm, last year precisely in march by mid you know when you have a farm and you put your infrastructure you put your water channels you need your borehole so sometimes three months ago somebody went into that farm and uprooted the the borehole machine they actually stole it so imagine that they didn't steal the snail they stole the borehole meaning that they stopped me from sending water to the snails so <laughs> it's a it's a different kettle of fish i think we need to the government, the stakeholders need to begin to address this insecurity. It is not for the individual. So I probably will replace the borehole. And if I don't man my farm, somebody can, else can go there and pick another thing. So that's how tough the sector is. Another thing I want to say is that agriculture requires patient capital. What we tell the youth is that we're not looking at today's investment. We're actually looking at tomorrow's investment. So imagine planted a tree, you planted avocado pear today, it's going to take you seven years or eight years to begin to harvest your avocado. But think about it. In the next 40 years, you will continuously harvest avocado every year. It means that there's a future income that comes effortlessly if you can cultivate today. So that's the story we need to begin to tell the youth, that if we can plant this perennial crop, it is good for us, it helps our weather, it reduces this spike in weather condition, and it will also grow in fruits and things that people can consume and pay for. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, um, Dr. Kukume. Before we before we move to Dr. Patrick, I was wondering if um, Dr. Akonde wants to respond to um, the the remarks that Dr. Kukume made to say that in terms of security and in terms of the challenges that the agricultural sector is facing, unless the government intervenes, there's limited options available to farmers, and and you know new entrants will clearly be discouraged because there's no solution. In place. Well, I, I, I think, um, thank you very much for, for uh, making me to uh, uh, add to that particular point raised. I think the first thing to understand is that security is, is a problem, and we need to admit and accept that. Um, but it's uh, an issue that needed to be, um, that required all stakeholders. I, I need to point that out strongly. Um, and, and this has to be led by the government. So um, I'm not exonerating the government having high responsibility in ensuring that they secure life and property of people, but I'm also um, including that it's required all of us to engage in this. We, we all have responsibilities, whether as a farmer, whether as a, um, um, as, a, as a government, or as a private sector. If we look at farmers and if there are good structure put in place, farmers can actually provide a stronger local intelligence about security to government. But as a matter of fact, 
a government may not have a better means of intelligence um, uh, or information than through the small farmers that are living within the particular community. And so um, you will see that from that angle, even the small farmers, community rural dwellers, um, have uh, 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 they are, they are, they are, they are part and parcel of people that will provide a, a solution to um, security problem. But having said that, it is essential for government to see this as a priority in all the design. I think you even recently started having nomenclature of uh, Greek uh, security now, not necessarily the food security, but Greek security, mm -hmm. that that has to be considered consistently when we are developing policy and strategy. Um, for us, um, and I don't want to limit it to a, a statement, I think this will be useful to all, um, it's becoming part of what we are looking into. What do we do, you know, across the uh, to ensure that um, security or the rural areas or where the farm uh, are, are, put, are put in place. Now, the question that I will raise, and of course that we may not have answer to here, is that how many of our states in Nigeria have what I call a rural development strategy? Rural development plan. In most cases, when you see plan being developed by state or even at the federal level, uh, what you see uh, are much more urban centric development plans. Um, if we don't have strategy that has to help to, and I'm talking about general rural development plans, I'm not even limiting it to security now, um, we will still be struggling. Most times, what you see uh, is what we refer to as the Federal Ministry of, of Agriculture and Rural Development or State Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. And I have had, that, had this discussion that in reality, that ministry, in my own opinion, should be probably broken to two completely because agriculture is not rural development. Agriculture is a component of rural development. There are so many other things that are required in rural development. You have the social development, you have the uh, physical infrastructure development, you have the economical development that nobody seems to be looking into. And all this, uh, if rightly done, those strategies are in place, we will start seeing some more uh, secured environment uh, for our agriculture and for our farmers. Having said this, I've spoken about the government responsibility, looking at uh, the fact that they need to secure um, uh, uh, as part of their responsibility, ensuring that we put in, in place uh, a better or robust uh, rural development plan. Um, of course, smallholder farmers also have a responsibility in terms of intelligence and information, but also the private sector. I will go into that. Um, private sector, we've spoken especially to our young people that will become the next generation or, or today's generation of agripreneurs. I made it a, a, in one of the, the deliberation again. Uh, the question that I asked is that the uh, challenges of, of different times determines the actions that are taken. So our time now have a challenge, um, which of course is not a make of the farmers. Uh, it's a critical issue. I also have farm, you know, um, and I also have the same challenge that has been said, um, that has been mentioned. Um, we need to start redesigning uh, how we even uh, the agricultural architecture. Um, what do I mean by that? If I want to get engaged, if you, if you look at living overseas, you know, um, um, uh, most times, uh, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in my house in, 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 in outside the country now. Um, I, don't have, I don't have anything to protect my house in terms of fence. Um, uh, you live in a house where it is probably you have just one small wood fence or something, you know, because those kind of security challenges are not in, in, in existing. That is in the house you are living. But I doubt if anybody that has the resources in Nigeria will build your house without building a fence around it. Why do we do that? Because we all understand that they are at that high level of security challenge. So I know it's not cheap. I know it's very expensive. But these are the things we have to be putting as part of our plan, you know, when we are thinking of developing agriculture, especially when it has to do with crop production. I think it's the high time that we start looking at it from that angle. So if you're a young man, you want to have a, 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 a farm, is it, uh, do you think that the finances or resources is available to get that done? Is it high time that the banks need to start considering that as part of the risk, you know, that is existing beyond the, the, of the climate change that we currently have? And looking at how to de-risk that, you know, maybe uh, to, a, to a small extent that is going to help to support, you know, um, the issue of the security problem that we are, we are seeing now. Because what much more of the security problem until all of late is much is, is much of the cattle strain into farms. So if it's about cattle strain into farm, if it's defense, it's, 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 it's fenced or it's, it's protected, maybe that will not happen. So the challenges of, of, day, of, of, of this generation demand another approach to agriculture. Of course, it's not cheap. It's going to be expensive. So when we look at this holistically and combine it together, 
I believe that we'll get to a place where we will start, you know, um, getting something better. We are going to be working with our small other farmers to provide local intelligence. As a matter of fact, they will tell you who was in their farm, who was in their area. They know the pathway. They know where they, 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 they travel through. All what they don't have is what they, to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. And lastly, mm -hmm. I think I will advise that the issue of technology should be adopted as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's not an easy thing to do. We're stratifying areas to become the agricultural zones and areas now. Mm -hmm. Our government probably need to adopt the use of drones and things mm -hmm. like that to start doing surveillance, you know, yeah. um, for, for you to get information as to what is happening in that particular mm -hmm. area. But, you know, I, will, I, will, I believe that there are more times to talk about this as mm -hmm. we go along. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Akonde. So if you're a young entrepreneur who is looking to go into agriculture, you need to factor in the current structural challenges and security challenges as part of your um, matrix um, before you go into that space. Um, finally, um, before we go into Q&A, Dr. Patrick, you talked about how you know agriculture is much more. There are different things along, um, along their cultural value chain. Um, so I want to find out, can you share a framework to help anyone interested in agriculture decide what value chain to focus on? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed, agriculture is uh, much more. It's really much more than it used to be. 20 years ago, uh, uh, what we did in agriculture was just to improve the way production is, is, is done. That's what we did 20, 30, 30 years ago. But as we evolve, there's, there's other aspects that are emerging. As the markets are more demanding, there's a, a demand for processed foods. There's a demand for services that did not exist before. So uh, anyone who's coming in agriculture has to think at all those other opportunities that are not just production. So a value chain is not just one aspect, it's not just production, but we are looking, when we're talking about value chains, we are really looking from inputs all the way to the table, if it's food, of course, to the shelves if it's non-food products. So that is very important, especially going back to the question you were asking earlier, young people who want things fast, they don't need to go and grow things, but they can market the products of the one who's growing the products. They can package it. You don't need to be producing food to be packaging it. We, I have a friend who's exporting uh, cut flowers and, uh, and fruits, tropical fruits. She does not produce anything. She's not a farmer, but she works with farmers. She has uh, associations and cooperatives that she works with. She she tells them the standards she's expecting. She provides some, some technical support. I think she pays an agronomist to visit them. And then at the end, at harvest time, she's there to harvest and export. So it's a win-win. She doesn't know how to grow, but the people who know to grow don't know how to sell at least not to export. So let's look at, at that. Now, when we are looking at value chains, what we try to do, of course, the Federal Ministry of Agriculture does a lot of work on the different value chains in different parts of the country. And when you go to each state, you will go to Oyo, you will go to Ogun, you will go to Kano, you will know what the, 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 the state commissioners will tell you what are the the value chains that, are, that have the most potential in that state. At the country level, we have that at the state level. So it's important to approach the Ministry of Agriculture and to approach the, 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 the state uh, ministries of agriculture to get that information. Uh, agriculture value chains are also about commerce. So it's also good to approach the chambers of commerce to know what is sold, what has a potential to for a market. The chambers of commerce, the Ministry of Commerce, they can have that type of information. In IFAD, we, we have a very big program in Nigeria called the Value Chains Development Program. And uh, in that program, what we do is that when we are starting to engage uh, the communities, the first thing we do is to do some, so, some analysis of the value chains existing there. So you are looking at the actors that are in that area, where is, what is the market potential? And then the, the, the communities, we select the value chains that they want to develop. In the, the, pre, the program we are running right now is just cassava and rice. 
because there are big agro processors who want to take in that product. So all those things are things to look at. What is the market for your product? Uh, where do you grow it? Is this the ecosystem that is um, the one you need for that? And you need to measure all of that because sometimes you can say, okay, this is my home village. Let me grow it, go and grow this in my village. But then there's no market in your village. If the market is 100 kilometers away. And then you will, for the love of your community, you will have lost your investment. So you have to look at everything from production all the way to the market and try to see what is the most profitable value chain. One easy thing for young people, you can just go in the supermarket and look at all the products that are there. It takes you 30 minutes. You go around it, you will know what people are buying. You Any market, supermarket, you will know in less than one hour what are people buying. And you will know what people are, are missing. These days, I've been, I don't know if I'm the only one in Nigeria, but I don't find milk. I've been looking for milk. I go everywhere looking for milk. There's no milk. So if I was investing in uh, processing milk, definitely that would be something to look at because it means that at set per certain periods of the year, there's a shortage. So those are things that you need to develop as your business. You need to develop the understanding of the market and then the market will tell you what can you grow and then you go back to see what are the right conditions to grow that commodity. So there's different uh, ways uh, to be supported for that, either from government, at the national, the state level, but also donors uh, like IFAD, we are doing a lot of work with value chains. Also our colleagues in FAO, they are also doing a lot of work around that. So there's definitely um, a place to get all those information to support you in your research. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. Um, so if I was to summarize, it would be, you know, you need to know your strength um, and what you're good at. And you also need to look at your environment. Um, there's no favoritism in agriculture. There's no emotional um, um, requirement or prerequisite in agriculture. You need to find out what's happening in your environment and you also need to know, you know, what you're good at. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. So we have our last question from, from the audience. Tyro Iola is online to ask her question. Tyro? Tyro? Okay, so I think we've lost her, but she wrote down her question on the chat um, and she says, who determines the market price of agricultural produce? Um, she gave an example, for example, cassava can be 40,000 per capsta today and the following week drops as low as 20,000, even though the demand and supply remain constant. Um, I, I mean, the little I've learned from economics, I know they are market forces, but I'll leave our experts um, to answer this. So I'll leave the floor open. Um, who would like to answer this question for Tyro? So can I, can I, can I try this? Can I answer some of those questions? Yes, now, please. Now, the, the truth is that agri agricultural produce is prone to cyclicality. Sometimes we call it the famous cobweb phenomenon that in a particular year, so many farmers will go into producing, let's say cassava, it takes 11, 11 months. It takes 11 months for you to produce and harvest the, 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 a particular variety. So if you look at your fortified um, cassava crop, it takes 11 months. Now, if too many farmers have entered into cassava that year, there's going to be a what, bumper harvest. So when you have excess supply, prices are bound to what? To drop. Now that particular year that prices have dropped, farmers will be discouraged to go into planting the next year. They will move into maize. So when most farmers are moving out of cassava, it creates a problem the next two years or three years, whereby there will be a glut. Prices will go up. Except if we now have, for example, what we're having today is that we're now having companies that are coming into process cassava into ethanol and process cassava into industrial starch. So demand is expanding against supply, which is why the prices of Gary traditionally in the market is very, very high. So you now have massive demand coming into play because companies are beginning to process Gary into ethanol, into spirits, and into industrial uh, starch. That's why you find this. Then secondly, 
Some of the agricultural produce are controlled by market makers. Take, for example, your eggs. The farmers don't co have control of the price of eggs. It is those who are aggregating the yaologers. They call them the market makers. So let me just speak your right here, the yaologers. So produce gets to them. They control the price. So the typical fish farmer, for example, who produces fish, will be so discouraged because at the end of the three-month cycle, he's going to offload his fish. The people who buy those fish are, are women. They come in droves and they underprice your products. By the time they are getting to the market, they are selling times two. They've not added value by way of feeding those fish, but they sell times two of what the producer gets. It becomes very, very frustrating because they control the market. And this is why farmers are beginning to shift their the marketing mix. They are beginning to shift to the farm gates whereby they process, they aggregate their wares and they sell directly to get reward for their efforts. So this is why a Greek product is prone to cyclicality. So I believe I've answered your question. Then the other one that talked about what strategy will the speaker give for safety of farms? This, this again, we say it's a macro problem. Collectively, that's why we talk about the cluster formation that don't go into farming as a sole farmer. Go into cluster farming. So if you have a cluster of people in one area, you now have strength. In strength, you begin to build what? Capacity to do what? To protect your farms. So the day you're not in the farm, some other farmers are on ground to ward off attack from whatever. But again, it's difficult for us to carry arms because it's beyond carrying arms. This is where I, I support uh, Dr. Kande's quest that all stakeholders but government must be the lead in terms of solving this security problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you can very I, much. Can I jump in as well for these questions? Yes, yes please. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. And um, uh, I completely uh, agree with uh, what uh, Dr. Kelly Lume was saying. For I wanted to add that uh, one of the situation, one of the things that we have is that our farmers are usually price takers. Anyone comes and imposes the price to them. And that is something that we try to change by also giving the capacity of farmers to negotiate. A lot of time a farmer will produce without calculating anything. They will bring, you no. Know, they will grow their cassava, they will grow their tomatoes, but without any calculation and they will not know at the end of the day, what is the, the price? that they should set for that product. That is one thing. And then they would not know how to negotiate. So somebody was very good. And uh, <laughs> those women who buy fish, I, I know they come and they are strong. They are, they, are, they are business women with their bags full of money. And then if you are broke, you take the money. So we, are try, we try to change that and get the farmers to understand that they also have a word to say in this discussion. Uh, what we try to, to, to do also is to bring the, the farmers and that from the beginning so they don't get bad surprises at the, at the end. There's also many other things that to, to also push farmers in some niche products. I mean, it's done in many countries where uh, if a farmer is gradually moving into like organic farming, they might get a market or fair trade, they might get a market where their products is more valued. So those are things we need to teach the, the farmers so they don't just sit and wait for somebody else to fix the price. And then also uh, there's something that we tend to, to, to forget is that we need to, to, to look at the market and grow for the market. A lot of time people will just grow without thinking, what will be my market? I was giving the example of chicken earlier. We all know at what time of the year people buy chicken, it's Christmas, it's the, the, the religious celebrations, different religious celebrations. So you have to plan for that. But if you, you produce and you, you, you are selling in between those moments where people are buying chicken, you will lose everything. So those are things that also you can control. There are things that you cannot control about the cycles of production, but there are other things, especially in livestock that you can control. I, I also wanted to say a thing about uh, security. We talked about security, of course, insecurity uh, as something that we, we need the 
some force to come and control. But there's also another aspect uh, that we need to look at, and that is also something we try to do at IFAD, is to stay hand in hand with government and invest in those areas where there's insecurity. Because young people are very vulnerable to, to banditry, to all those groups that will attract them to do different things. So by creating uh, opportunities for young people, especially in those areas, they are less prone to go to engage in those type of uh, activities. Why would you go and do banditism if you also are owner of a farm? Why you, would you go and destroy the farm of your neighbor if you are also a farmer? But if you're not a farmer and you are sitting there and you are not seeing any opportunities, it's possible that you will engage in those type of criminal activities. So that is also one thing that we do at IFAD with the government to mitigate the, 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 these problems of insecurity is to remain in areas of insecurity. And of course, insecurity is multiform. Not all Nigeria has the same type of conflicts. So we have to understand that what we have in the North might not might be different from what we have in the Niger Delta. We need to understand that, but then we need to see how can we maintain a presence. Because the worst thing that we do is that when there is an area where there's a lot of conflict and everybody withdraws from that area, guess who takes over? The conflicts take over. So we have to find that balance. It's not an easy balance. And again, it's not for the youth to go and do that, but it's for the, the decision makers to understand that there's combating insecurity, but there's also mitigating insecurity by creating opportunities like we do in the agriculture sector. So that's uh, what I wanted to add, just to give another perspective on insecurity from the mitigation point of view, not just from coming and, and stopping insecurity, but also preventing from young people to engage in those type of activities. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Dr. Patrick. It's been a very engaging session. Thank you, Dr. Akonde. Thank you, Dr. Kelokume. Um, I like the fact that we, we, we brought the discussion, um, we stripped everything away, we removed the glamour, and we went straight to the point. And I trust that our, our participants are more confident to go into agriculture if they feel it is their passion and they can thrive in it. Thank you very much. So we're just going to go on a quick short break and afterwards we'll be having the closing remarks from the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Okay, welcome back. We just finished a very interesting session on the business of agriculture in Nigeria, where we dissected the challenges that our new investors or um, 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 career um, graduates are likely to face. We also discussed solutions, possibly solutions to them. We also gave um, our expert advice that you need to analyze your strengths, do your risk assessment, look at your environment to identify what is profitable before you decide to head on into the business of agriculture. Right now, I'd like to call on Mr. Bolariwa of the Ministry of um, Agriculture and Rural Development to give the closing remarks. Okay, um, I just got a feedback that Mr. Bola Riwa is out due to network issues. Um, quite quite sad, um, but hopefully we'll get to a time where this sort of issues will no longer spring up on us. Well, it's been a very interesting session. Um, I encourage you to stay on. We have two other sessions today at 11 and then last at 1.30. The one coming up next is the business of agriculture, nutrition and lifestyle. And we all know that now we have a lot of feed farms. Now we know that a lot of people are healthy and looking at how they can make their lives better and elongate, you know, their period here on earth. Um, so thank you very much. Once again, my name is Olade Johnson Nagiri, and I've been your host for today. Goodbye. <music>
has a story to be told, a future to behold. There is more to who we are than what they hear. We have love within our soul, fire in our bones. We've got everything it takes to make it here. There's much more within our soil, more than just our oil. We can grow the food to feed the whole world square. Agriculture is the key, there's treasure in the trees, the time is